So Anatoly Klimov has been a leader in the field. He published an absolute stonker report this year at ICCF uh, and also uh, later in the year. He's famous for building plasmoid-based or plasma vortex-based, similar to Malcolm Bendel, but more intense. Mm -hmm. He actually visited Ken Childers and spent a couple of weeks with him and built it from that. Uh, he claims a cop up to 10, right? And this CVP is only up to two if he does not include a material that slows down neutrons or and absorbs them. I worked this out in 2018. I gave him a couple of years to talk about it, and then I forced him to in a presentation. When I actually first mentioned it in 2018, he just started sweating. You could see this bead of sweat coming down his thing. And he goes, oh, and he came to me the following day. He says, look, if I don't use lithium, boron, uh, cadmium, indium, or gadolinium, I get a COP of up to two. If I use those things, I get a COP of up to 10. Why? Something has to be interacting, which is neutral, but is not a neutron, with those materials. It's actually, it's, for some reason, it's bound. So, broad scale transmutation. Why transmutation? In his latest data, he found by having some elements, you can get elements that when they interact, they produce a gamma ray. He found that, so this is producing radiation next to his reactor. When he runs his reactor for about two days, the amount of gamma rays that are observed by the same detector are reduced. <coughs> this is exactly what Ivan Filomenenko claimed in 1957. He could reduce the environmental radiation near to a reactor. Mm. And it's this two-day figure. You'll see this two-day figure over and over. In Matsumoto's book, he shows these structures that decay over two days, and only after two days do you see the synthesized elements. Use of uh, this is why I got very excited when you said about two days for, for your emissions. Very excited because you're like the seventh person now that's seen the same thing, but all in completely independent systems. Use of cheap carbon nanoclusters is his latest thing, although he hasn't been telling anyone, he's been doing it since 2001. So rather than using specially prepared materials, he's actually using carbon. Now why? Carbon can produce buckyballs and it can produce all kinds of different allotropes, and these can aggregate fantastic amounts of electric charge. You're going to see why that's very important in, at the end of the presentation. N-gate technology is a branch. N-gate has had their plasma vortex reactors verified in Portugal. They are using historical versions and extending them. So it's like a branch off Klimov's work. There's a company in the UK that's also done it. So, novel plasma focused detonator with carbon clusters in hydrogen iron fuel. This is a classic, although it's not, it's a hedgehog with a snake, but it, he's taking the snake out here. He's using a hydrocarbon plasma. He sees a COP in a standard one of two to four in these kind of devices. This isn't using any special metals. This is just copper, a hydrocarbon, and electricity in air. This is the device. So the problem with Eric Lerner's, and all of these devices since the Russians uh, developed them in the 60s or 70s for investigating fusion, is they have an electrode called the snake in the middle. And as the plasmoids come together, they cause the electrode to get transmuted to hell and damaged to hell, and it, it fails. This is the problem with LDP fusion, which claim, if you see what Eric Lerner said after this report, uh, on Donald Trump buying this or investing into this organization recently, He's come out and said, our oh, device does a lot better <laughs> already. Anyway, so here we go. This is the device. What he's got, he's got, he's got an erosion plasmatron that produces a plasma of the fuel instead of the electrode. And then the pinch comes here separately and produces multi-axis hydrodynamic helicity in there to do a pinch. He's solved that problem. It's an absolute genius invention. And he uses, not thermometry, not calorimetry, not bolometry. He uses shockwaves. You cannot deny power from a shockwave. Mm. He's the expert in shockwaves. He invented the, the laser spike to allow hypersonic missiles and planes, right? So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to shockwaves. So he has microphone arrays here. It produces the, the plasma shockwave, 
And you know, for it to get from there to there in the, in the fractions of a millisecond, it had to happen at a certain energy. This has been known for an extremely long amount of time. It's zero in debate, it is producing that energy. Brilliant, brilliant science. So, uh, we'll skip that. This is the, the, the money shop, they're using steering, paraffin, a range of different materials. 1.2 milligrams per shot is your fuel. So you create the erosion plasma jet, then you inject the helicity and it produces the overall structure. No central electrode to be destroyed. It's only the fuel. So what in, in the past with, the, with one of these arrays, it was coming in and it was trying to organize the plasma where the snake was. And that's why it was destroying the electrode. Now he's got the fuel and so the plasma can do what it wants to do and go ahead and make the disruptive work. 2,000 meters a second, he observed these eruptions up to 10,000 meters a second. Okay, do the calculations, input, output energy, with the amount of fuel you're putting in, it comes out at 2 million electrovolts per atom. This is nearly the same as Alexander Parkhamov's uh, data, 2.1 million electron volts from his nickel hydrogen reactor, which I presented at the same conference in 2019, ICCF 22, on behalf of Alexander Parkhamov. Same kind of level of energy. Transportation of chemical elements in this system. We have production of zinc, calcium, aluminium, lithium. There's no aluminium in there. That must be some sort of nuclear rebirth, or at least cluster fission. Where's the lithium coming from? Where, where is the zinc coming from? That's an easy one. You've got a proton going into the copper. That's an easy one. Calcium, where's that coming from? But you see calcium and you see aluminium. You see these in, in the work of, of uh, uh, Iwamura, a clean painter. Uh, uh, Again, here, using X-ray spectroscopy, fluorine, oxygen, silicon, aluminium, and sodium. So, it is somehow creating ionization energies of 20 to 40 electron volts because of the level of ionization they observe. They've got second or three, third level ionization. That's quite high energy. People don't do think this is a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy. Okay? Uh, and they've got this uh, at less than two kilo electron volts, and a flux of low energy neutrons have been detected. A flux of low energy neutrons has been detected. So they are producing neutrons. So this is one from the MFMP. And this is myself, Bob Greenia, Al Goldwater, and Griffin Brock. Griffin Brock is a child prodigy. He's the first person in 120 years to replicate Tesla's shadow graph system. I predicted that this shadow graph system is producing dark matter rays, etheric rays, and that it would remediate nuclear waste. It would be producing directly the radiation suggested by Filomenenko. This is the setup. You have a 1920s di uh, 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 diathermy unit into an open air coil into this tube which has a single aluminium electrode. And over here we have a bunch of standard radioisotopes. They're in a stack, uh, that, that's the thing close up. They're in a stack like that. You might even recognize them from the colors if you want to call them in the past. This is the device, and there's the sparks, just like the E, the proven excess energy generator. It's exactly the same, this is from the 1920s. This device is made in the 1920s. So, uh, that's just talking about the history of the spark, but that is our isotopes that we had in there, in a stack. So the idea is I'm firing a beam of this radiation. The idea is we can clean up Fukushima, we can deal with nuclear waste. This makes a practical, then a technology that can potentially uh, allow nuclear fission to proliferate in a way without thinking about the risks, because you'll be able to clean up any issues and deal with the radioactive waste. So we put it on, looking at the gamma and the beta, and we got the, the, back, the background rates, the background rates and the rates for the, the samples, for each one. And then the exposure looks a bit like this. We expose it in total for 12 minutes to the radiation stream. 12 minutes. Okay, here's your money shots. There's our isotopes. We've got our 
before, uh, after five sample av uh, average, and the normal life life is this, using that and then doing a sampling afterwards and seeing what the uh, activity of the sample was. Decay acceleration, 8,483 times per polonium 10, 210. 7,710 for cobalt 60. 330,000 for strontium 90. This, is, this was verified in a calitation system uh, called uh, uh, Hydrowave technology, uh, and it verified Cladoff's remediation of cesium 137, which we're going to look at next. They didn't believe him when he was alive. They only used the cavitation system afterwards, and they verified that he could remediate uh, strontium-90. And that was in a program, it's in a semi-classified report in, in the use of Cesium-137, 53,434 times, and thallium-204, 79.808. Now, the things are partly magnetic, and so you have some magnetic materials in here. So I need, to, this is an initial test just to see if there was anything, and it appears that there is. And so I would like to do individual tests with this device without the one in the way, because it could be caught. The structures, as we know from Matsumoto, and we know from Ken Shoulders, they, they, they can bind to iron or ferromagnetic materials, and cobalt-60 is uh, ferromagnetic. Okay. So the experiment challenge is, we only ran for approximately 12 minutes before uh, sampling. The carbon at the front end uh, could affect any processes because carbon is a moderator and these structures get moderated by carbon. Okay, so that, that's, that, that's, I actually have carbon there which I need to send off to the beam line and to see how fast. That's natural carbon from charcoal. So I need to find out how many half lives that's gone through. Um, position on the radiation sensor, I only did pre sampling once, post sampling. Uh, the, 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 there's a couple of caveats here that I would like to do. And also, I did not see what the radiation was like after two days. Maybe it drops for two days because there's a structure there and it's preventing the emissions. And then after two days, it returns back to where it was. So I don't know, and this needs to be done, uh, and I would like to have done it after one week. Now, here's, here's the closing out slide. I was in Marioka, and I was giving my post presentation about where we are in our understanding. And after that, I left, and I'd been given another 60 kilograms of uh, Matsumoto's materials. We didn't have enough baggage to carry it all home, so I brought scanners, and I spent the entire night not sleeping, scanning, and anything that was like someone else's paper that he had annotated, or a, a reference thing, I scanned and threw away. And I only kept the things that were genuinely his work. But in that set of documents, I found a series of documents stapled together. They were post-dated documents. They literally had the envelopes with the stamp on it, and they were all from 1995. So my poster is this. I suggested this, and I suggested magnetohydrodynamics. This is the 3D structure, and you also get cluster decay. So you can see carbon produced and oxygen produced because they fall off the end. Because some people think binding energy per nucleon is an average for every atom in the nucleon, every nucleon in an atom. But it's not. We know that from beryllium 8. Its first nuclear fusion and fission was Cockcroft and Walton. They took, uh, uh, they took uh, lithium 7 and they fired a proton into it. It fused to make beryllium 8 and then it fissioned into 2,4 helium. Why is that important? It shows you that the, bind that the binding energy per nucleon of four helium is far higher than the binding energy between those two four helium, which shows there are weak points in every atom. All you need to know is the first thing that proves Einstein right, okay? And so carbon on this model of uh, 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 atoms by uh, Pavlos Smira is often on the end of molecules, and so is silicon. Like silicon's on the end, so you can, if when you have a vacuum decay process into a topological monocle, whole parts of an atom can just fall off based on the weak parts of the structure. The same way that beryllium eight fell apart. This, this is the paper that was in there, in those documents. This is proof of restricted information. Here. The plasma stays in a small confined space. Heat and electric power can be extracted from the plasma on an as-needed basis to power any device from small water or small water heater 
all the way up to a system that su uh, supplies electric power for many cities. The resulting fusion energy swirls into a spherical wall that creates its own self-holding magnetohydrodynamic effect in a stable shape. This is called fusion-powered ball lightning. He cited a couple of papers by him, one paper by a Russian guy, one paper by an Italian team, and Matsumoto's work and Ken Shoulder's work. The same two papers that have been cited as the first two references in a functional proven device by George Eadley. Right? 1995, sent to President Bill Clinton. All of these directors, all of these the major labs, and it was published in a journal called New Energy Times in September, this same reference. And in that reference, it showed a, a basic, not very well drawn magnetohydrodynamic structure. And it says the nuclear reactions occur in this core. At least what I found out, having spent 13